Thank you so much for coming. It's such a scary time, as you all know. Um, U.S. was the first country ever used nuclear bombs. And actually, U.S. Um, invented it originally. And since then, or even before, unfortunately, our economy and everything is going on militarism and nuclear. And, uh, and Ellen helped us understand what is going on, the danger. The good news is that 122 countries in United Nations got together and passed what Ellen was talking about, the resolution of abolishing nuclear weapon and making it illegal for the whole world to use to use nuclear weapon. It needs you folks' help because um, U.S. is not going to give it up. We heard people who were campaigning for their election that we have nuclear weapon, we should use it. They don't know what does it mean to use nuclear weapon. That definitely is not what happened in Hiroshima, Nakazaki, which was such a sad thing, and everybody should go see it, really. Um, Just a minute, Lori. I want to ease the... Um, Excuse us for... Sure. You want me to turn this off? Well, I want to turn off the Wi-Fi. What is happening, unfortunately, United States is starting to threaten Iran. And the same as they don't know what does nuclear war means, they don't know what does war with Iran means. Iran is located, Iran is located between Russia with nuclear weapon, Pakistan, south, and um, China, and India, and China, India, and Israel. Five nuclear countries are in the neighborhood of Iran. And Iran is now surrounded, as you see, by U.S. military bases all over, surrounded another, yeah. So they are surrounded, Iran is surrounded by U.S. military bases. And um, if, I don't know to say, if God forbid, but whatever, if United States would go to war with Iran, that would be the end of the world because the five nuclear countries right around that, they're not going to stand still. And Iran itself, you can kill them or whatever, but you cannot bend them. And that's what United States is trying to do. If, you, if we go through the history of Iran, I passed Uh, I passed no war with, on Iran, and I also passed a century of U.S. aggression against Iran. All I would do, I would look at, I would look at these, and I will just highlight, and you folks ask me questions, and I will answer because there are so many, so many things that we don't know about the history of what is going on in Iran. Sorry. Who is the real threat to the peace? You know, fact. Iran does not possess nuclear weapon. It never did. During Shah, U.S. started to provide Iran with nuclear weapon. And maybe you can show the... Yes. So, so this is a, um, what do you call it, uh, animation of 
uh, arms shipments from the U.S. to all parts of the world um, from the end of World War II until about five years ago. I forget exactly when it ends. And in the middle of it, I will mention how Iran stands out in this. So you can see the countries. Right. After U.S. coup d'etat against Dr. Mossadegh, then US be uh, Iran became the biggest purchaser of American military for quite a few years, for more than 10 years, was the biggest purchaser. And Iran, as the gendarme of region, was supporting with Iranian oil money the wars in Middle East for United States oil, for United States to get oil from Middle East, which, of course, after that, uh, after the revolution, Saddam Hussein became the agent for United States, and then they created war between Iran and Saddam Hussein for eight years. Okay, As you know. we seem to have a bandwidth problem here, oh. but, uh, plus a connection problem. Um, uh, Ellen, is that because the hotspot? Yeah, no. So this this does take a lot. Anyway, what this yeah. what this does uh, it shows the exports of U.S. weapons to. Each country up? in the world. I, would you stand up and talk? <laughs> yeah. Shows the it, um, animates the uh, flow of weapons from the U.S. to all the countries in the world, almost all of the countries, uh, and the width of the flow tells how many weapons uh, were exported, uh, probably in dollar amounts each year, from the end of World War II to somewhere in the 20 teens. Uh, Iran stands out in this. It's, it's the one country that's mentioned specifically that in, 19, in the 1970s, the decade of the 1970s, more weapons were sold to Iran than any other country in any other decade since World War II. For uh, 10 years, more than 10 years. And, and that was until that the, was the end of the Shah's era when he was building lots of, uh, well, He's building a tower in the Middle East. So you can understand that why when the revolution happened, the biggest customer of the biggest product of United States went down. That is one of the biggest reasons that since for the last 40 years, United States is trying to overthrow the system and do whatever they can and saying that Iran is uh, access of evil or whatever else that you hear repeatedly. That is because Iran was defending gendarme of the region for United States interest in the whole Middle East for 26 years, which cost Iranian lots of lots of executions of their youth, educated ones, uh, Evin prison, which I end up in Evin prison with the help of United States in solitary confinement with executions of uh, most progressive and also help with the whole region in um, Dofar, uh, in Iran, with, with Iranian oil money from uh, protected United States interest and uh, stop their revolution, the country's revolution, people. So we can continue. Uh, the revolution, the uh, coup d'etat in 1953, it wasn't just a coup d'etat. We hear, uh, here, we hear coup d'etat, and we think coup d'etat, what is coup d'etat? Me, as um, from age, of course, before 10 years old, United States started. But in, when I was 13 years old that coup d'etat took place, one of the movies of Iranians that I saw, which I wasn't in Tehran, and you would see that girls, 10, 12, 13 kids, 
tanks were coming the day of coup d'etat, filling out dead and not dead bodies of the girls and the boys and the men. Blood was dripping from their hair and they were moving. They weren't quite dead, some of them. Tanks filled out one by one and passing. These were the day of coup d'etat 1953. And then the executions on and on and on of our youth started. My brother just finished his medical school and he was put in um, solitary confinement. And actually a friend of us right away arrested him and put him in prison purposely because he didn't want, because he was a friend, he didn't want the other Shah side. They arrest him because they would execute him right away. So he kept him, they kept him in prison for some time. The same time that we were in, nobody wants to leave their country, their neighborhood, their homeland. People like to visit places, but they don't want. There are seven of us, five, six MDs, PhDs, they were all, we were forced to migrate to United States while, while they made it hard for us to live in our own homeland after overthrow of Dr. Masatek. And then when I moved, I, I want to read these things, but forgive me if I am out of the CIA coup d'etat in 1953, return of the Shah. It wasn't just the oil money, it wasn't just military. It destroyed a whole nation of now 80 million, then 30, 35 million people. Military purchases of Iran largest in so many years from 1970. Oil revenue giveaway since 1900. British was getting it, then United States carried coup d'etat, and they both were getting it now. Largest oil producer for, um, they probably, you can hear history, read history and see that Second World War, they say it was won on Iranian oil. That was even before Saudi Arabia had this oil in, in the Middle East. CIA created and trained Savak, Iranian Savak. Iranian Savak was the dreadful um, that I was put there when my father died in 1978 and I went to Iran taking my mother and I was American citizen. I went to Iran taking my mother for funeral. They put me in solitary confinement and I was there for um, two and a half months. Then later on they felt that she's no good, we better get rid of her because they were so busy with the revolution that was taking place and was going on. So they, they were torturing and imprisoning and execution of progressive national front after the um, coup d'etat to the party, which I was very young, but I was part of youth of to the party, workers and peasants. And Iran continued to be gendarme of the regime for United States and uh, the whole Middle East making it safe for United States for oil and for their military purchases. <coughs> Iran revolution, when it happened, uh, Khomeini was uh, popular, but nobody knew him. There were so many leaders at the time of revolution, and the United States felt that any of those would be dangerous. So their best choice was Khomeini because he was anti-communist enough that they could use him in the Middle East, and that's exactly what they did. So they brought him from Iraq to Europe, and they propped him up, and they, they helped him with so many spies 
that they became minister of, one of them was, uh, that I knew him as I was member of Iranian Student Association and I could see that he is a spy because he would jump on the table <laughs> as pretending that he is member of Iranian Student Association and he would pretend as if he is opposing the Shah and thank you and um, so U.S sent quite a few spies as ministers and sent Khomeini, except Khomeini himself was not spy. Khomeini, when people um, were anti-imperialist and suffered so much, he would go by whatever people were saying, except he did repress the way United States wanted all Marxists, all communists, uh, Afghanistan helped the United States with Afghanistan to overthrow uh, Parcham and Khalq, the, the parties, the left parties, also helped with the issue of Russia, so uh, to, to really anti-communist and anti-communist in the whole Middle East. And soon after revolution, all of you know that, uh, that um, Saddam Hussein with U.S. help carried eight years war in, the, in Iran and in Iraq, killing about a, more than a million Iranian and Iraqi youth using chemical weapon against Iran and, um, and two million maimed in the two countries for eight years war that the United States carried on. After that, United States continued uh, dropping. It was a cinema that we had, that was before revolution. Cinema with 500 youth and children, they go to cinema. They burn the whole, they burn every young person and everybody that was there, United States helped doing that. Airplane they dropped with 290 um, passengers, Iranian airplane, civilian airplane. Um, they also supported Mujahideen, a, a uh, clan against uh, Iranians. And the unfortunate things was that Mujahideen was a progressive progressive religious movement with so many children, youth as member. As the result, the government killed so many, Iranian government killed so many of these children. Every household, every household had a member, a child member of Mujahideen, which with the help of United States, so many were executed and killed. Recently, they attacked Iranian Majlis and they killed a member of Majlis and they killed somebody in supposedly the most respected place, Khomeini tomb, somebody, they, they killed somebody in there. They also helped ISIS and um, uh, the other one. Al-Nusra to attack Iran. ISIS was created by United States. In, Af in um, Afghanistan, we have now four million, three to four million Afghani refugees because of the war of United States against Afghanistan. And these Afghani people, they don't, they are now second citizen in Iran. Also, with the help of United States now, uh, they talk about Taliban. Taliban, when was in power in Afghanistan, tried to reduce the opium. And now opium is flooded, flooding Iran and all of our youth, age 20, 18, 22, 20, whatever, all of those youth are opiate addicted. The gift of the United States for Iranian youth. 
They talk about nuclear program in Iran. Iran, only during Shah, with the help of United States, they start nuclear program. And when he left, Khomeini said, this is against our religion and we are not going to have nuclear program. But sometimes when you advertise something against your enemy, it fires back. And even Americans believe that, oh, Iranians have nuclear weapon. So uh, US um, created that um, JCPO, that Joint Comprehension Plan of Action to stop Iranian nuclear weapon which they promised to stop the sanctions, which they didn't, but for so many years, Iran was abide by it until um, your new president and our new president pulled out of that. Even after that, one year, Iran uh, stayed compliance with it. And this was not just a contract between United States and Iran. It was five countries and United Nations resolution. United Nations, but United States pulled out and now you probably hear every day what they are doing with Iran, including in state of hormones, the Iranian uh, oil tank that is helping Syria, they take it and they, they stop it. Or they have drones on Iran and uh, which was shut down, uh, spy drones. We also, you also need to know that the drones on the top, on Iran, they killed so many scientists, Iranian scientists, probably you heard. U.S. is helping Israelis with U.S. passport to get to Iran and select Iranian and kill them, whoever they feel that. And these are the things that the United States does. And also, at the borders of Iran, which is bordered with Afghanistan and bordered with, um, with Iraq, they send, they create movements and so-called movements and uprising against the government. Iranian passenger plane, you know, and you heard about it. There are some books here, I brought a few of them. It's interesting, something that was so much advertised by United States, and I want you all to know about it. We heard so much about hostages. There were 53, there were 53 hostages, none of them for more than a year supposedly in Iran, they were n not really hostages, they were spies that they, that Iranian students, when they tried to take over the embassy, they shredded the documents that they had, these American spies, they shredded documents. Iranian students, they put these documents together and they made five, six books. This is number four, that they put all the shredded books together and they translated to Persian. You got to get the English version of it to see what it is, just to see the truth of the spies. And here are every part that you look at, it says highly, this was mostly about Afghanistan, just this one is about Afghanistan. And it was about so many other things that the American spies in Iran, they were spying in the whole Middle East. And this says highly, all of them, all of them, it says highly confidential, highly secretive. No. Kayli Mahramane. No, yes. is this, is they admit it. Yeah. They admit it, they're proud of it, or Tom Schaefer anyway. He's you know, making a living being a uh, motivational speaker. And um, I was forced to go and listen to one of his motivational speeches by my employer. And he said, oh yeah, of course we were spies. We were all military intelligence. Yeah, and, and when I was, 
And when I was talking in United States, I was in Medical College of Virginia studying. And when I was talking that, okay, Shah of Iran executed, killed so many youth with the help and force of United States. It's so interesting for Americans really to even read the correspondence of Shah with United States representative. We read the book and, and Shah was much more tamed than U.S. helping him to become what he became, killing so many, 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 many Iranians. And I was lecturing or I was writing articles saying that um, you should let the Shah go and face justice and your hostages will be released, your hostages. And CIA came to me at my home and threatened me and said, we are paid, we are paid to kill you. Me and my two children, they came and they threatened me. And also Ku Klux Klan, I print, I send it and it was printed with blood. They wrote on something, putting it in my mailbox saying that we are, we are assigned or we want to kill you and your children. We will, th we will cut your throat and your children, written in blood and putting it on my mailbox. And I took it to the university and showed it. CIA him himself sent spy because I was writing that. And you probably heard that none of, this, none of these spies got hurt or anything. And so many Iranians got killed in the United States. So many. Even a sheikh that is Indian and they don't know the difference. I don't know it's if um, Ku Klux Klan or whoever killed him. They don't know the difference between sheikh, um, sheikh, sheikh and Iranian. So they thought he is Iranian. Such a, I felt so guilty that he wasn't even Iranian and they killed. And they killed so many, many Iranians in the United States. I was a student then and they stopped allowing the student using their money bank when they confiscated, when US government confiscated billions of dollars of Iranian money, Iranian student in United States, they, co they couldn't access their money in the bank. And I had to go and talk and say, look, this is not Iranian government. This is a student needs to eat and they send money for him to go to college. Or they were harassing students and any Iranian, I am sure so many of you, you remember that. Sorry, my apology. This is my number. Hmm? Now we take questions. Yes. But before we go into the questions, yeah. I, I passed two petitions around. One of them was wide, and that was to the Senate, asking for ratification of the UN ban treaty, and the other one was up and down, and that's to the House asking for co-sponsorship of Eleanor Holmes Norton's bill. The wide one. What? The wide one. Okay. <laughs> so you can sign both of them and, and send it along. Um, and I also we, we're going we're going Alan Shore. We didn't introduce him, but this is Alan, and um, the three of us are going to Japan at the end of this month. And we're going to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Nuclear Free Kobe. And um, we are um, asking if you would like to write a letter of support. We're going to have a, a ceremony with uh, some atomic bomb survivors and present to them the petitions that we've gotten signatures on, copies of them. We're, we've also, we're keeping the originals to take to the United Nations. but. We're taking those, uh, we've got over 8,000 signatures so far that have been collected by WILF members, um, and that's the wide petition. And we're suggesting that maybe you would like to write a note to the Japanese atomic bomb survivors, and we brought some paper and pens, 
if you would like to write a message individually, uh, collectively, whatever you would like scatter, to do. Do you want me to scatter paper? Yeah, I'll scatter paper around. And the other thing is, and you can do this while, while Nori continues. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Dan. The truth is that Mossadegh did not start asking for nationalization of oil. For more than 60 years, for actually 80 years, British was taking oil from Iran. Originally, there was a contract between Iranian government in 1880-some with one person, Darcy, a citizen of Australia. When oil was discovered in 1890-some in Iran, British right away purchased half of the contract of Darcy because oil was relatively on the surface in south of Iran. And for more than 80 years, 70 years, they had the books, they were keeping everything, the contract was to give Iran 16% of net profit. Even that, they didn't give it to Iran. So Mossadegh, for five years struggle before 1953, from 1948, was asking British to open the books so that we are partner. It is Iranian oil. You have had it for 70 some years, 79 years. Let us see the books, what is going on. Are we getting that 16%? For more than a year negotiation, British was not willing to do that. They did it. Then they went to United Nations and they asked for help. Dr. Mossadegh wrote and sent a message to Eisenhower and say, we would, we would accept you, we would appreciate if you represent both countries and help us after the oil was nationalized and all that, help us the differences of the problem between Iran and British. Eisenhower himself carried the coup d'etat against Iran rather than responding to Dr. Mossadegh. And that 16% which they were never given Iran, even that was cut. And Iran too, shipmen wanted to send to, uh, to, Tur uh, to um, Italy and British overthrew the uh, ships in the ocean, Iranian oil. Just like now that Iran probably you heard a tanker for oil for sending to Israel, United States, to Syria, I'm sorry, uh, Iran sending it to Syria, U.S in the Strait of Hormuz, U.S. stopped it. U.S. confiscated. Like in our own waterway, the other side of the world, U.S. is controlling Iranian car. Was it in the Gibraltar? I'm sorry? Gibraltar? Yeah. It was, location was there, yeah, you are right. But Iranian tanker. Have you ever written a book about your personal experiences? Because it's really fascinating. You haven't written? Some, I have. You've written a short article? Yes. You should write a book. Thank you. I will. Um, we're planning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Or blog site. So 
what I was going to ask all of you. What we are doing in Ohio. We live in Ohio now. I'm going to pass my cards. Um, we have every week peace speech. And people love it. People pass us and they like it. You can have once a week, one hour, a peace vigil standing. Peace is powerful. We got to take it in our own hand. American people want peace. They do. And we got to take that power in our own control and stop them and say, no, that's enough of taking. Remember, six trillion dollar, T, T, six trillion dollar means million times million we spend only in Iraq war and we didn't get anything. Saddam Hussein was on our side, American side. We got rid of him. Look what's happening in Iraq. After six trillion dollars of your taxes, that should go to healthcare, that should go to education, that should go to better housing, infrastructure. Look at the homeless in LA and San Diego and everywhere. Look at our prisons. Look at the kids at the border that we attack every Central American countries and misplace them and they come there and they are the danger. And now six billion or something for wall. Look at the way they are doing on our name with our money. So few of them and so many of us. Something wrong. So what can we do? We can Why unite that? together. We can have repeated peace vigil and standing there and saying, I'm not going home until I stop this whole thing nonsense. Enough is enough. It can't be worse for us here even. A country with so much wealth. Be conspicuous in your re rejection. Yep, yep. That is for youth, that is for your children, grandchildren. That is for the world. The world is, borders are phony. If there are borders, what are you doing in Iraq? What are you doing in Afghanistan, in Libya, in Syria? What are you doing there? If there is a border. Uh, I, I'm concerned about renegotiating the START Treaty. Um, Putin has said he's offered to re renegotiate the START. The START Treaty expires in 2021. Uh, what if it expires, then all the countries will have a nuclear arms race and they're going to blow each other up. <laughs> the truth. As an American, I would be worried about American militarism. There are a thousand military bases outside United States, a thousand inside. There are 22 veterans commit suicide daily, daily. No nation would tolerate something like that our own citizens after going and suffering so much they come back this is the way they are being treated so really what we need to we need to stuck together very strongly it can't be worse for us it can't be any worse no matter what you do it can't be any worse well, it could be worse. <laughs> uh, well, it is worse if we don't do anything. It can't be worse. It can only be worse if we don't do anything. That's it. If we stay the way we stay and not do anything about it, 
it can get worse. But for our situation, it can't get worse for us. This leads into active. So I think Sacramento Wolf and uh, Peace Option might, and some of the religious groups in Sacramento might come together and uh, talk about how to go to Mayor Steinberg to put Sacramento on the map of Mayors for Peace that isn't already. Right? Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Another thing I wanted to say is that Ojai, the city that we live in, they did pass, I passed this also, uh, they did pass actively not to be part of nuclear weapon and any organization, any company that deals with nuclear weapon, not to deal with it, city council and all that, not just mayors saying that, but so they are, so you can, you can make your city be part of international city of peace. You can talk to your representative that they cannot do with your money with uh, corporates that are working with nuclear, that are producing nuclear weapons. I mean, there aren't so many cities that they have done that. Or state. Even California is not at that level. And you can work to make California to completely stop all the nuclear and all that. Nuclearban.us is doing a lot of work yes. in that regard, and they're a yes. good, good group to work with. Nuclearban.us gave Ojai an award for becoming a nuclear free city about six yeah. months ago. Yeah. And do, do, you, do you all remember, do you remember the 1980s when the nuclear freeze movement was going on and how people got so organized over it? Um, we need to do the same thing. We need to have, res we need to have um, voter initiatives or, or uh, referenda where people can vote on w what we think about this. And, um, we can pass those out, certainly. Yes, yes. Yeah, I just want to say something about something, uh, maybe a little bit in the future that people can do. I think if we all keep in mind that the Poor People's Campaign exists yeah. uh, with Reverend William Barber and Reverend Lizzie Harris, um, and you know, and that we do practice civil disobedience, and it's a national organization, right? So, um, denuclearization, demilitarization is one of the four pillars of the Poor People's Campaign. Creating, a, you know, rewriting the moral narrative, that's wrong, right? The nuclear, having nuclear weapons is wrong. So if we just keep that in mind, for whatever our issue is, but this one in particular right now, that at some point, those who are working uh, focused on the anti-nuclear issue, you know, uh, denuclearization, maybe you've already done this, but to, to contact the leadership of the Poor People's Campaign or the leadership in a key state where a key, uh, where you're trying to make a key point of this needs to stop, and at some point, um, we, get, we, we do civil disobedience there and related directly to poverty and to racism. And, you know. Sure. It's all, it's all interconnected. <clears throat> all of the issues have to do with the, the fact that our money is being spent on, on death and destruction and not on health and, and, and the well-being. Yeah. So... It's uh, peace action. Peace action has, has got a lot of people involved, and you do really, really good things. And peace action has a newsletter. May I ask if these remarks may be published in the newsletter that you put out? Sure. If you'll give me your email address, I'll scan them and, and, uh, uh, and send them to right. you, and you can do what you like with them. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. You betcha. Thank you, folks. I think all right.
Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> well, do you have anything that you want to add, Alan? Um, I think something about the, um, the hostage crisis. That's really the, the most misunderstood thing about it. Um, when the students invaded the U.S. Uh, they suspected a replay of what had happened 20-something uh, 20, 20 years before during the coup d'etat, that the U.S. was planning to have another action, even though there was a, a revolution and uh, the Shah had been uh, out of power for close to a year by that time. Uh, the U.S. was not very satisfied with what was, what was happening. It wasn't going the U.S.'s way enough. The students suspected that the U.S. was planning further action, and in fact, uh, not this book, but uh, one of the other books, or several of the other books in the collection of things the students put together after they uh, uh, pushed their way into the embassy, showed that in fact that was that was the case, yeah. documented in top secret documents what what the U.S. was planning. Um, so the fact that the students were right that the U.S. was planning further uh, violent action against Iran and the fact that the, uh, the hostages really, uh, other than a little bit of embarrassment at the beginning, uh, really did not suffer that much uh, at the hands of the uh, students uh, is not well known in this country and really should be uh, better known. So uh, is that compilation, that's of course in uh, Persian, yeah. Yeah, we, we haven't been able to find... But you said there was an English title. Right. This, well, this, this was all in English. The, the documents were all in right, English. This, this was published in Persian. Is there this was English? published in Persian. We've been trying to find the English version of it, and we haven't been able there to... Is a, there is now. an English version? There are. Of course. In Iran, but not in the U.S. The U.S. doesn't allow, doesn't even allow the Persian version. They don't. This is for all from Iran. Yeah. No English, no Persian. Remember, about six months before the taking of embassy or spy center, U.S. carried a coup d'etat, which were, uh, which it was at the, uh, where was it? At the uh, Fury Carter. You heard all that they brought the planes down in Iran, and they were caught. Oh, this so was a rescue operation. The that, rescue uh, operation. That went sour, yes. Yeah, the rescue for, for the operation. For that's the what was brokered to defeat Carter and bring Reagan. Right. right, after that. Uh, right. So there were so many, many. In coup d'etat in 1953, they did it five, six times until they succeeded it. They right. did so many, many before coup d'etat. So many, many. Black Friday in Iran, which I didn't mention, because there is so much. Black Friday in Iran, they killed. There were two, two um, politi political stand in the United States. One was uh, Nixon and uh, Kissinger and the group. They were saying that we need to keep the Shah and kill as many as possible. As many as needed. Yes. As many as needed to keep the Shah in power. The other power in the United States, which was Carter, and the group saying that Shah has done its service. Now it is a debit for United States. We got to get rid of him and bring somebody else. And that's when they groomed uh, Khomeini. To that's when they back. groomed that's Khomeini. Actually, before that, several progressive changed, and U.S. messed up and didn't allow. To the party was powerful. They destroyed to the party, and they killed and killed and killed. Uh, the, uh, all on the side of Dr. Masadek or National Front, so many they came to power and they killed and killed, killed. Here we hear coup d'etat and we don't know what does it mean. 
but in every country, in, in Indonesia, America killed one million in two weeks. In two weeks, they killed one million people. We don't know about these things all over the world, hundreds and hundreds of countries. The US has training center what of America? School of America has now changed the name. It's called training. Training. Iranians would come and do mostly Central Americans, but all countries of the world, they would select and they would bring to United States and they train them how to go and kill. How to go and be master of the people. They're still doing that. School. They still it's are still doing open. They school. still are doing it. Is it Fort Bed in Georgia? Or right. It's, it's yes. got another name now. It's, it's not, another name, but it's it doing first. exactly the same school. thing. School. And we are saying oh, it in a way. This yeah, the Mark Jean has something to do with an annual <laughs> protest. For hundreds and hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of years, years, in hundreds and hundreds of countries, we are doing that today. Well, just look at Honduras. Yeah. I mean, if you want the latest example. Yeah. Yeah. And El Salvador. And El Salvador, Honduras. And when they come, they, they are forced to leave their country. My family was forced. My family in Iran, they didn't let us have jobs or MPs and PhDs. We couldn't, we were in prison. So. When we came here, oh. mm. that's the way it is for the world, for the whole world, and the United States is doing that. Well, we're trying to change it. Yeah. Sure. Do you, do you have a, uh, a chance to talk to a lot of different groups? Because, you know, uh, Americans are so uneducated about what's really happening in the world. And have someone like you open our eyes is just incredible. I mean, we, we see what has happened in Iran, but as you say, we're doing this stuff all over the world. Yours is only a part of the picture. <laughs> but do you speak to a lot of different groups? As much as I can, I said. Um, as I said, I was seriously threatened. <laughs> From CIA, they came to me and they said, we are here, we are here to kill you. What year was that, Nori? Huh? What year was that? That was 19, when hostage, hostage crisis happened. I was in Medical College of Virginia and I was writing articles. And I said, look, students publish these, these read them and or send Shah to face justice and your hostages will be here. They, they were threatening me. CIA was threatening me. Ku Klux Klan was threatening me. That was probably in 1980 because the Shah yeah, came yeah. to this country in the very late 1979. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the hostage, that's when the hostage crisis started. How did that affect your life like this? groups are coming to you and say, we're going to kill you. How did that affect your life? You know, when you are born in one of those countries and you are facing all of these things, it's part of your life. You resist. Now when I say they killed so many, all of those many that I mentioned, they did the work that I did. I'm just being, I don't know, lucky or whatever. I don't consider it lucky because it doesn't matter really. I mean, when the truth is that when they arrested me to take me to solitary confinement, I thought, I was thinking to myself, I said, oh, am I as good as all those thousands and thousands and thousands Iranian that they resist? that they write all those books, so they are arresting me or they are making a mistake. Mm -hmm. I was kind of happy. <laughs> so who was it that arrested you? Sabah. Sabah. 
was created by CIA. The military police. The military police, police. in Iran. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. the branch of CIA in Iran. Yeah. U.S. has, U.S. has the training torture center here, and they have branches of CIA in all those countries. Savak was the name of the branch of CIA that United States created after coup d'etat in Iran. And Savak executed and killed and tortured many, 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 many. Mm. I was in prison and I would hear, in prison it was, the prison was so small that because I was alone in prison, I would put two of my, my two hands the other side of the wall, and I would put my two feet this side of the wall, and I would go from this side and back, go back in front, I would go, 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 and I would go up a little bit, further up, further up, further up. So like my feet was hitting this, like that, and my hands was hitting the other wall. Solitary confinement is small. So my feet, it was as small as that. So I would go back and forth, back and forth practice until I trained myself because I was there for so long and I didn't have anything to do. I practiced. <laughs> One day I was up there. <laughs> and for a second, <laughs> The prisoner lady opened the door and didn't see me. I was lucky that he got, she got scared and closed the door and <laughs> ran right away because I fell down, except right after she left, which was good. She thought you were gone. She went to uh, the prison guard and told the prison guard that she's gone. Mm -hmm. But this is solitary confinement. You can't go anywhere. Right. It is. It is so, it, it is not wood, it is uh, concrete, concrete, concrete and dark and all that. It's there. So then now I was down and the prison guard came angrily to see what happened and they saw me sitting there. <laughs> and he told, Meditating. <laughs> he looked at the lady prison guard, he looked at her as if, She's so crazy, she's sitting <laughs> And she was looking at me angrily that you weren't there. She knew I wasn't there. I knew I wasn't there. But I was acting like that too. I'm, I'm sitting here. <laughs> How long were you confined? Two and a half months. Two and uh, about five days. Less than three months. So why did they let you go? Because they were very busy with so many, many. I would hear regularly at the middle of the night and during the day, they would torture youth. And it would be, usually they wouldn't uh, forget to drop what you could see outside. But once in a while, they would forget, they would come look inside, with, um, but they would drop it that you couldn't see outside. But once in a while they would forget. And when I would look, there were prisoners that they would torture them, young prisoners. And then the prison guard would carry them, and you would hear their foot on the ground not being able to walk, being pulled by the prison as they would torture and go and go and go. Did, from they, did they torture any women? They, of course. Oh, sure. Did yes. they ever torture you? Well, not, not in a sense of physical torture. One time they put me in cold, freezing cell. And one time, <laughs> One time the prison guard came and said, if I kill you, and if I say you insulted his majesty, I will get one more star. Oh my goodness. I said, sure, you are telling me that if you murder and if you lie, you will be promoted. Of course, that's why you are there, I am here. 
<laughs> so he didn't know what to say for that. Yeah, it's good to remember that, yeah. that she was in solitary confinement about six months before the uh, the revolution culminated. So there was a, yeah. a, a lot of bubbling. I even felt that I had nothing to do with Iran. I just knew a few uh, Iranian students. It was really perking a lot at that at that point. So they were probably filling up the prison. Yeah, uh, they without were it. And she wasn't as serious as a lot of the other people. Do you think you're still under the, um, in the eye of the CIA? Do you think they're watching you to see what you do? Oh, I'm sure. But even, even though, really, there are so many resisting. Some things that's not worth for them to do much. But we do see racism in the United States, what it does. That is because a lot of it is resistance. A lot of it is um, knowing what is going on and doing things about it. And in Palestine, we need to learn from Palestinians the resistance. That's a war of resistance for 100 years, for 120, 140 years. 140 years ago, they started taking their land. And the whole population is standing up. We, we need to learn what is resistance. And they tell us, oh, go do your shopping. We do our thing, you do your thing. And unfortunately, for hundreds and hundreds of years, we are used to that. We go our own, they keep us busy, two jobs, having such a hard time to survive, dividing us, Spanish folks, black folks, dividing us, and all of that keeping us going. And the telephones, looking at the telephone, and all of those things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How is it? I cannot believe what is going on. And we are so quiet. It's, it's everybody's life. If they attack Iran, the world would be finished. Not because Iran is a big country, it's not small. They are very, very resistant. It's no joke. But there are five nuclear countries right around there. You attack Iran, the world will blow up. Right. I promise you, unfortunately. I'm well, that's what, it, what they say. Is and they that say. If they get attacked, that they will, they, will, they will get the Israeli nuclear facility. That's right, of course. Because they know that the very first thing that the United, United States and Israel in the Middle East, that would be it. That would be it for the whole world. I think sometimes about Nazi Germany, and people say, "Well, why, why didn't, why didn't the people in the country do something? You know, why didn't they, why didn't they stop Hitler? You know, why, why didn't they allow him to do all those things?" And then I look at the United States now, and I think it's so much like Nazi Germany. Actually, we all need to read. If you truly read the history, true history, you will see that Nazi Germany was created by United States and was helped by United yeah. States. And after that, even all the Nazis were welcomed by United States, thousands of them. And, and now they support Zionism while Jews were attacked and the United States did not allow Jewish ships to land to the United States. Did not allow them. Pushed it off. Said literally, no. Literally. Literally. You turned the ship around. She turned the ship the, around. Was in the harbor in New York and said. That's right. That's right. Send them to Nazi Germany. Oil companies military industry, and so many other companies in the United States got so wealthy before even German became German. So it was all on the money-making. Second World War was that. And then Marshall Plan made the United States even more wealthy. 
And if you read, if you, you need to read, Truman said, this is a quote you can find. I this, am, this was when he was a senator before he became when president. When he was a senator before he became president, he said, we should help Germany if, we'll continue until we fail, Russia is becoming strong. And we should help Russia to attack Germany. And they did. In reality, U.S. supposedly was part of ally. Didn't go until one counts says 35 million one counts says 28 million Russians were killed. 28 million people. At that point, it was one out of three. And 40 million maimed and the whole nation. North Korea, after that, we did more than four and a half million people we killed. In Vietnam, we did three, four million we killed. Everywhere, everywhere. Let's count since Second World War. Second World War would not have happened if United States wouldn't have helped. Corporations. The whole difference between British imperialism and US is that British had the face of colonizer. Everybody knew was so clear. US corporations do it, and US says we want to take democracy with killing. Let's go to expert democracy. For Dr. Mossadegh, who was, for Iranians, he was Gandhi, more than Gandhi. He was such a, such a peaceful man. He was such a leader. He was so humble and so loving and so caring and so opposed to any kind of war. What are you talking about? Mossadegh, Dr. Mossadegh. <laughs> And this is what ha was happening in Africa at the same time when uh, Patrice Lumumba was killed and uh, Kwame Nkrumah was off in China and there was a sort of soft coup in Ghana and all these men who were wanting social and political reform for the good of their countrymen, not of the elites but of their countrymen, were all being, being called communists. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of the discussion. Mm -hmm. And so that really started the train that we're on now. I mean, this is the same. Look what they're calling Bernie Sanders. I mean, you don't call him a communist now, because we all know he's not a communist, but socialist is next bad word. <laughs> but what is communist? They try hard to make it a bad word, but it's not. A lot of people know it's not a bad word. No, I know, but I mean, for the, ma for the masses, they think socialism is for the masses. They think socialism is they think, yeah. it's they think it's communism. No, but I just have to tell you, as as a teacher in high school, they don't. Are these people grown up. No, the when I explain, when you explain, communi yeah, right. yeah, they they may not have heard about it before, you know. Right. But then when they do, and they understand that it's health care for all, and it's, you know, you know, we're not going to have people evicted all over the place, right. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, they, um, they, they're fine with it. Right. When they understand that a dictatorship of the people, where the people actually rule rather than the elite billionaires, they, they right. say, oh yeah, 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 that, that, okay, that's fine. They don't have any problem with it. Right. It's, it's the, the, those who, some of those who have grown up during the Cold War, who, who, who have that similar mentality, but there's so many more of the rest of us. There are many who are much younger than I am, but they, this is a non, um, you know, in other words, trying to scare people with, yeah. oh, he's a socialist. Yeah. Oh, great, that's fine. Well, first of all, what is it? Right. We like what he's saying, right. Right. you know, we like what Bernie's saying, we like this, we like this, we like this. Uh, he looks like the, you know, terrific, so he's a socialist. Oh well, that's good. Right. That must be good. Right. No, so, so, so talking about socialism nowadays is like the, where some people on certain quote liberal radio stations that have corporate funding, you know, um, trying to scare people with socialism. 
forget about it. It's like, don't worry about it. Right. It's but like, you use it's a dog whistle, but they no, are using that. It's a dog whistle. Yeah, but it's not going to affect most of the people. The, the people who did not grow up yeah. in the Cold War, right. Right. they're more focused on getting rid of racism, getting rid of the economic injustice. Bernie happens to be doing that along with so, so many other people that he I actually agree. brought up. I agree. I agree. But, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with that. Actually, at times I say, well, I'm grateful Donald Trump came because you know, woke up people. Some people, at least. We need to because increase the percentage. <laughs> yeah, but if Bernie Sanders had been elected, we would be talking even more about socialism. Yeah. 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 Oh, so. Well, history well, shows that people really living when there's a major crisis, yeah. finally hits them in the face. Yeah. It's in my face. Mm -hmm. It's not a neighbor across the country. Yeah. But it's yeah. in their face. That's when they move. Right. Right. Yeah. Maybe it's time to call socialism and communism more what it truly is, it's altruism. Hey. In a biological sense, it's a pack mentality for survival. That's right. Rather than this individual competition for survival. Our backgrounds in science. So we very much look at it that way. It's altruism when we're going together as a unit for survival, rather than each man for himself. Interesting questions. Yeah, altruism. Maybe we could call it that. And then you get the people from that Cold War era that are passing that individual capitalistic mentality down to their children and that racism effect is still repeated in them because it's being passed down and the rest of us we're passing down the other side to our children right like we're passing down to our three-year-old three daughter about altruism and you have yeah you have to so you have to stop that you know the other side of it we have to stop that being passed the negative sense being passed down and that those rude awakenings are what help and i think the personal stories like nuri has is what helps to wake up some of the other people um, some of my friends have been more and more interested in what we do with will you know as trump came in you know too uh, uh, you've been telling me about this group you're with <laughs> tell me more now so it's it's interesting how they, they hear things and they listen, but they're not fully awake until right. something bigger hits them in the face or comes their way. I wish somebody would do a documentary on this woman. Oh, yeah. 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 It could be so should, powerful. Mm -hmm. We should she work on that. What she fun. sees. Yeah. And how strong and brave you are exactly. to keep standing up and resist. Yeah. I look up to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>